So now, yeah, anyone that's still left here, feel free to open up the conversation. And again, a lot more inform informal discussion like for the next hour or for however long people want to stay. Um, sorry, can I? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just no, I've, I've already spoken. I don't want to take any more of this time. This is just for, based on, on this breathe in, breathe out concept that Yolanda just men mentioned and, and pricing. And let's say in a center like London, if people are to be leaving more and more and then certain offices or high-rise buildings are not going to be used for whatever purpose they were supposed to be used does that not mean that you'll have much more housing stock hence lower prices in london i think you're muted you so I just muted myself to answer that. Now. Um, yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. I think I think uh, it's potentially beneficial for those who stay in this the city as well. Except, of course, that some people, particularly those with uh, the more expensive to run sort of pro properties, may well start losing out in London. Uh, so. Yeah, it, it, it swings it swings and roundabouts but uh, i i suspect you know a, a lot of housing is going to be cheaper when we come out of this i think um the people who think we'll just bounce back to uh to, to normal pricing um just mi miss it missing what's happened to large numbers of the population in terms of affordability but we'll see so for for an arch from an architect's point of view for example if you were to have a property that had let's say 30 percent studios is there the possibility to say I will combine two studios to make a, a one, or two, three, or anyway, so in the sense that they'll still be making an income because they'll be selling or renting large properties if they combine their smaller ones. Is that? Is that a yeah, and, and then um, the, the name of the game becomes how flexible have you made that building? Mm -hmm. Too many kind of poured concrete buildings you know, just lack that, that capability of, knocking through and of course it's, it's one of the great advantages of the typical sort of London terrace townhouse that of course they've been they've been knocked through knocked not you know I mean they, they, they've been infinitely flexible and I think it's one of the big problems of a lot of 20th century architecture that is not as flexible as the old the older types but where it is I think it will win out do you think you land on housing, like when, when you talk about space, just because it's something's bigger, obviously, doesn't mean it's that flexible. And I know, especially in the US, some of these grand Victorian properties were turned into much smaller flatted accommodation, like, like the, the, the townhouses here. But some of the McMansions that were built, I could imagine probably would resist that for, for one, for being in isolated locations. Probably the organization probably doesn't work and building codes with fire going between floors wouldn't happen. I would assume that that hopefully maybe McMansion, McMansions could be a casualty that we wouldn't miss that much. Yeah, I, again, um, you know, th there are trends in, tra I mean, th th solving the problems of, of, of the, the Mac mansions of the USA uh, is, is way beyond my scope, but, but they were already suffering. <laughs> what, what, what you'd find is that the um, new build neighborhoods that say in the 1970s were the place to go, the place that the, the affluent sort of escaped the central city and went to in the, those suburbs, they've actually been de-gentrifying since that time. Um, and what was tended to happen is it's happened in waves. Uh, the de-gentrification has in price terms has been largely disguised by the fact we had this uh, incredible house price inflation across the developed world, well, actually across, across, across the world generally, as a result of falling interest rates, I could go into that, but uh, you, we had this era of a uh, very high house price inflation, which I believe is over, which hid a kind of relative devaluation of certain environments and certain types of property. Um, what in commercial property you might call obsolescence and depreciation just remained hidden. And I think what we're facing is, is an era where that um, high, high rates of capital appreciation are, are no longer there to hide the obsolescence of certain forms and the depreciation of certain types of housing in certain neighborhoods. So I think we're going to we are going to talk about degentrification, uh, and I, I predict it will be concentrated on the car reliance sort of McMansion esque 
sort of housing estates um, that are unable to to adapt and and urbanize. I hope, I hope so. <laughs> Stefania, were you planning to uh, knock down two studios into one? Sorry, I think I may have been ahead of my time because I moved out of London into Winchester, which is a a more mm -hmm. humane scale for, for me. Also, because I got into that classical that typical stereotypical way of had a family, moved out of London sort of wave. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, this is more out of my interest of what's going to happen holistically, not necessarily personally. But what's interesting there is that um, you, like a lot, a lot of people uh, who've moved out, out, of, out of London, out of the big cities lately, chose Winchester. You chose an urban a little bit, a small city. You know, um, I, 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 chose Canterbury, a you know, very similar sort of um, thing. We don't want to be away from that, I don't know, creative, interactive sort of urban, uh, yeah. Yeah. we don't want to be completely away from that kind of feel. So I, I grew up in Athens, which is a, a chaotic, chaotic city to, to, to be in. And then I found London more villagey than Athens. I know it's a bigger city, but I know that, but it seems to be broken down into smaller areas, whereas Athens is one just one big mess. And then moving to Winchester for me, and I, I, I say it to friends and they laugh. I, to me, this is a village. I feel like I've moved into the into a village. So this is, I think, as small as I can go for now. Who knows? Maybe in the future I will move further out. But for now, I think this is what I could handle of of small space. Yeah. Good. Robert, during the chat, I saw some of your comments on artificial intelligence, and I could only glance at it quickly. Was, was there anything that that, that, cause that led to a few different threads going back and forth? Yes, well, I think um, because the COVID crisis is the big thing and how we're reacting to it, um, it's a, occluding the, the other changes that are going on in the, the economy. Um, robotization is hitting manufacturing jobs. Um, artificial intelligence um, is going to hammer administrative jobs. So, uh, I mean, insurance, most of us buy insurance through a computer now, rather than maybe 20, 30 years ago, a lot of us would have done it through telephone sales or uh, a broker. Um, and I think this will happen more and more across the economy. Um, it's we're we're assuming that um, reasonably high paid jobs can disperse across the country, but in fact they may evaporate altogether. Um, I think that's worth spending some time considering. I don't know how much, how equipped well equipped we are to consider it, um, but it's it's a warning sign. You heard it here first. <laughs> Um, last week um, on the, uh, the retail and mixed use session, uh, Paul Reynolds was leading it. It was it, it prompted me, I guess, when I when I wrote to you, Yolanda, just thinking about use classes, and and he was suggesting maybe there is a more open, temporary use class that could be in in um, in effect for a certain while. And it always I always went back to the idea that you looked at informal settlements and said when you actually went to them, they were all the same. And actually, when you look at them, they look like what became formalized in Italian towns. Yeah. And, it's, and every time I can't get that image out of my head in a very positive way. Yeah. Yes, wonder, the slide I often use is sort of modern day Sao Paulo uh, merged at the same scale with uh, medieval Florence. And even the materials are actually quite, quite similar, but the, the, the scale the streetscapes are just so hugely similar and uh, you, it's it's almost as if there's an anthropological um, sort of element to city making where and we kind of know this instinctively if you go to an Inca city if you you'd land it you could time travel back to ancient Benin if you go to the Hutongs old Hutongs of uh, uh, Beijing you know a whole variety of historic and very widely geographically dispersed um, uh, cities as a human being you recognize where you are you, you you understand the language of the street because that's that is how human beings build habitat 
if you, if you like, is as, it, it, you know, so we're as, we're as at home as a badger would be in a set or a, uh, birds would be in the nest, you know, that, that's, that's how we recognize our species habitat. Um, so, uh, and, th and this is something I think um, is one of the themes we're exploring at the Institute is um, what we call community inclusion, because that's the kind of the, the buzzword, as it were, in the industry. But what we actually mean by that is, is the capacity and capability of ordinary people to co-create places and to, to trust them to recognize um, how they want to live. And people do vote with their feet. You know, there's a reason why Mayfair is one of the most expensive uh, pieces of land in the world. Um, you know, people recognize, um, uh, you know, a good, a good, good urban form is, uh, you know, and, and so often, and uh, forgive me, the architects among you, but so often we think it's all about architecture and the way, you know, a building looks. It's not, it's about the way a place feels. Um, and we've, I think, very singularly attuned to that as human beings. Do you think, um, so there's been lots of criticism of permitted development rights. And it kind of aligns a little bit with my thinking of if we could get rid of use classes a little bit, if, if we could experiment a bit. And, you know, there's lots of images and the architect in me says it's ugly, but sometimes there's this horrible roof extension, which is so grotesque. There's something interesting about it. <laughs> or um, when you go to Italy, what I really like is you can see the blocked up windows that, that were once there, the patterns, but then there's a window strangely up here. And I think it's more interesting in that sense, because it shows the life of a place. And I wonder if sometimes it won't create the Mayfairs, I don't think, and the high value, but it'll allow the extension of space when people need it. What if we were a bit more free um, and what the risks are? And I think most people's knee-jerk reaction would be, no, it's bad because whenever we give people a little bit of freedom to do this, it turns out bad and it wouldn't pass planning. But is that such a bad thing? I, I don't know. It's just... Well, of course, the thing about shanty towns and informal settlements and squatter settlements and so forth is that they are not completely unregulated. It's not, it's not that there is no planning uh, or that there was no planning in, I know, uh, medieval York, for example. There were city regulations. There were, um, you know, the, there was control. There was hi hierarchy. It was just that they were a different sort of set of regulations. And the point about planning use classes is that actually they're designed, they're really just investment asset classes, uh, part of the big money sort of 20th century method of um, the big institutions managing their portfolios. And um, planning, if you like, has been uh, coerced, um, uh, sort of duped into, into, into playing the same game. Um, and we have to question, I think, whether regulating the way that a building is used inside the building in actually quite old fashioned ways, what's proving to be quite old fashioned ways, um, and will be, be even more old fashioned after COVID, you know, what is an office, what's it there for, et cetera. Um, I, th I think we've, we've missed what it is actually important to regulate, which is, things like what kind of impact is this building going to have on neighbours and, and the people? You know, we, we've got to think about the people much more. And there will always will be conflict. And the point about the shanty towns and so forth, I mean, the favelas uh, of Sao Paulo or Rio are very, very heavily controlled, just happens to be by drug gangs. Um, you know, they are policed and controlled. Um, the, there are landlords in the squat, uh, squatter camps of uh, South, South Africa. They don't own the land, but nevertheless, they control it and therefore act as landlords. So, um, you know, I, th I think we, we shouldn't think that everything has to be uh, controlled by, in the way that we do it at present. And I think the permitted development rights is a very good example of how we just seeking to regulate and control completely the wrong thing. And um, it's not the people who've, who've uh, created the, the monstrosities of flats without windows. Um, it's, it's rapacious, you know, opportunistic landowners who are playing the system, the weird, weird system we've got. It reminds me a little bit of the, um, 
the conversation around Almira in in Netherlands, the NVIDV scheme, where I think it's DIY urbanism they call it, where they only have one planning restriction, which is you can't do any harm to your neighbour. Um, and then there's sort of individual plots. It's a really interesting, really interesting typology. Um, if we go back to um, London after the Great Fire, we had the uh, the London Building Acts. Um, so there's a sort of building control approach to new development rather than planning. Um, we've got environmental protection regulations now, which should uh, deal a lot with the bad neighbour issues. But is the fundamental problem that uh, sprawl, things like that, are, are basically down to uh, the cost of transport or indeed the, the lack of a cost of transport? Um, the uh, transportation is very, very cheap. Uh, it, it becomes almost no object, no, no object. You can disperse out into Canterbury and still maintain a job in London. Uh, you have the beautiful downs. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a. Um, I'm, I'm in in Tunbridge. Um, uh, my railway journey up to London was subsidised by the taxpayer. Um, it's not necessarily a good good thing that that continues. Um, similarly, I'm pretty car dependent if I want to do anything other than uh, go to the farm shop or the 7 to 11 at the garage. Um, so the, what are they? It, they're the components, building control, um, environmental protection regulations, and also put that doll down. Oh no, it's it's your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Deegan, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. yeah, she was fascinated about the talk, so I thought I'd better bring her in. Hello, hello, Miss Deegan. Um, yeah, uh, road pricing uh, or some sort of pay as you go system for, for travel that covers its full cost, building control, um, and environmental protection. And um, maybe the planning system is given a bit of a break. Any thoughts? Hmm. I was just thinking throughout a lot of this, um, you know, if we're facing huge environmental issues and now a huge pandemic um, mood, if, if this is one, we're going to get others. It just really reminded me that if cities are just, seem to me just functions of capital, of they've created cities and towns have just happened where work and things have happened. If in the future all of our work is going to be different because we can all work at home and there's going to be mass unemployment, won't cities and towns just be, won't they just follow what function we have as humans in the same way as cities kind of emerged around factories and then have collapsed while industrial industry collapsed and then they recreate into something else or not, as the case may be? Isn't, is it a matter of planning at all? Won't it just follow whatever we will be after all this across the whole world it's going to change they call this geographical inertia don't they um i know um, there's a guy andrew dakin who's on the um, urban design group executive um he was involved in the regeneration of the south, uh, south wales valleys and i think his his career achievement he he reckons is just um managed decline um there's <laughs> never enough public funds available to enable the community to totally regenerate but also there's always just enough funds to stop the community collapsing yeah. so you've got people who are held in place in a position of relative poverty um there's neither regeneration nor collapse and uh, reallocation of resources mm. I, I grew up in buffalo new york and it was you know it's, it's like a detroit it it, it lost it was 600,000 people. Now it's just under 200,000 people. And it's lots of poverty. Um, and when you grow up there, you actually don't think it's abnormal or mm. it's weird. Um, and then there, there's blocks upon blocks in the city, not where I grew up, because we were in a first ring suburb. That was 1950 suburb. But people just get on with things. And it's, it becomes less about money. And when you move to a place like London, you realize money makes the world go around. But actually, it's London is based on that. New York's based on that. The bigger the place, the smaller the place, the more you rely on people and people are willing to do stuff for free and it's more sense of community. And I wonder if as places quote unquote collapse, it's more about the economic vision of a place and is 
until people are poor enough where they can't have food or stuff like that, which is a very different thing. I think they'll still they'll still move on and they slowly decline, and then at some point they'll 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 open up again. And I think you even see that in the UK, where yeah. until only recently the northern cities have have turned around in the last decade or two decades. Um, but I, it, it, you're right, the normal ebb and flow of places. But I think people yeah. I mean, they, 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 a lot of the. It's interesting. I've been on a world tour of cities uh, with my son, looking at universities, and it's really noticeable how a lot of the cities that were, really weren't doing that well uh, back, say, 30, 40 years ago, have now, with mass expansion of um, further education, are doing fantastically well. In fact, Portsmouth, for example, where I went, is 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 hugely better now than it was 30 years ago. I think as a result of the of the university expanding dramatically, and other places. Birmingham was another one. We did like what, four or five universities. It's dramatically better than what it was years ago. And noticeably, towns that don't have a university don't have that inflow of capital, for one of a, and culture and people yeah. and everything like that. But don't have don't, have not done well. And um, so, in a way, it's just an example. Isn't it a transformation of these former industrial places of being repurposed to something else? It's just making me think: what is our future purpose going to be? With so many sort of tectonic plates all shifting around at the same time, it's what, what I noticed also about these places that were in decline. And like where I grew up was, people are quite pessimistic because people tell them it's bad that the jobs aren't there. And and now when I go back, I honestly don't necessarily see it much better. I see that yes, there's a bit of a riverfront, a, a lakefront. There is a you know the, the roads are paved. They're not so bad with potholes and stuff like that. But what I really notice is the, the optimist per, uh, perception amongst the people. People aren't complaining anymore. They're happy. Um, we, we just moved um, for six months now. We're in, in just south of Lisbon. And when I asked people, what was it like before? And they said, well, in the 90s up to the expo, people were pessimistic. And then they became optimistic. And I think mm. if we start valuing different things, not just economy and GDP, that people potentially are happier. And, you know, Lisbon was wasn't a terrible place. It had a great climate, an amazing city. It was crumbling a bit more a couple of decades ago, but you know, it was still a great place, but people were pessimistic. So I, I think it's yeah. what we value and what we perceive the place to be. Yeah. I think. It's I mean, almost designing, sorry. It's almost designing for um, civic infrastructure and giving people a chance to play. It's time very much you were talking about um, linking into kind of co-housing cool models as well. Because then that also then links into what are the successful um, industries at the moment and we're seeing through this pandemic and that is the delivery services are more and more people going to get their shopping delivered are we going to see last mile delivery is it going to be designed for that so you've got smaller your roads that still need vans down but then you could get the cargo bikes down there as well and then mm -hmm. having the sharing model tied into that you're building in why have people everybody have a cupboard for ladders but you can share around neighbors mm -hmm. obviously it's a disinfected ladder but you know what yeah. i mean <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing Stephen was talking about, you look at London and a lot of the London universities are wanting to move out of London and a lot of regional universities are wanting to come in for a presence. Yeah, yeah. 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 So like, you know, you've got the um, Clyde, Olympic Park and then... Clyde University in the South Bank, I noticed the other day, unbelievably. Yeah, York St. John are down in um, London as well. And then you've got um, Central Mar St. Martins moving out to the Olympic Park. Um, and then there's ideas for setting a, a satellite campus at some of the uh, London universities out at Ebbsfleet as well. So it's almost like they're getting chased out of London. Mm. <laughs> mm. I, I think that's part of the urban dispersal story. Um, yeah. I think I think that's that that is exactly the sort of the breathing out and fragmenting and mm. dispersal. What's that? What's that book? Is it the Digital Nomad? But you know, you can work anywhere and just plugging in. How do you do that as a design team with obviously the taking over a big BIM? Mm -hmm. um, how are, and then it's a feed in. How does the retail, real estate, uh, the retail um, sector tie into the housing as well when you get the changes? Mm. My my other sort of thought was wondering as people talk about tr you know transportation and dispersion and being remote and is. It, it, on the opposite side, there is this idea of hot networks, isn't there, where, where people actually like, despite their ability technologically to be anywhere in the world or something, people do tend to gravitate. I'm generalising here. My understanding is people do tend to gravitate into hot networks of similar people doing similar things simply because they like to go and talk to people of similar like-mindedness. So that kind of counters, uh, you know, 
will people carry on doing that? You know, um, I'm, I'm trying to think there's one in sort of west of London, sort of Silicon Valley kind of thing, wasn't there? All the computer people kind of wanted to be in a place where they could all sort of talk to each other. Um, I don't know, maybe this whole lecture has been about the, the ability for our technology to sort of just not bother with hot, well, not hot networks anymore because we just don't need them. Well, the signs are that, that actually the most technical people actually value the um, the so social interaction more. So why else would you have Shoreditch? You know, theoretically, those guys could code anywhere in the world, but they, they will gather together, you know, uh, in, around Silicon Roundabout. <laughs> so Silicon Roundabout rather than Silicon Valley. Yeah, and actually yeah, you yeah. find in Silicon Valley, in uh, you know, Google are having to bus people out of San Francisco every day to go and work in the valley because they all want to live and play in the city in San Francisco. So in this digital age, actually the quality of the interaction becomes more profound. And that, that feeds into the retail experience as well. We're all talking about how uh, the internet you know, changed, undoubtedly has changed the conventional high street, but it's interesting that a lot of uh, online entities are actually establishing um, bricks and mortar um, showrooms because they recognize that people need to sort of, sometimes they need to touch, feel and see and you know, uh, smell the, the, the pro produce or the, the, the product. Um, so I think... We, we haven't gone right through the whole, whole permutation or even perhaps even started to go through uh, what the full permutations are of digital technology. Mm. But it does strike me it has um, a part to play in the kind of regeneration of northern towns. Those that have regenerated are those that have, have been able to accommodate and incorporate the creative classes, for want of a better word, you know, Hebden Bridge, um, you know, Derby has a lot of high tech um, industry and is actually quite affluent. So you've got you've got these pockets of affluence in the, in the north because they they can behave, or they've got universities, as you pointed out, that can behave culturally, socially, much more like the more prosperous places in the southeast. Yeah. But you've also got northern towns like I know Blackburn, Burnley, Blackpool. You know anything beginning with B, it seems Bradford, whatever. That <laughs> kind of do. stay stay uh, sort of stuck behind. That can't can't make it into that sort of yeah. arena. Uh, maybe they will. They will. I think. I think there are there are potentially reasons why they will start to do so. But. Yeah. There's an example, isn't it? And I forgive me, I've forgotten what it is, but it might be Middlesbrough or somewhere like that. It doesn't begin with B, um, where it just obviously was nothing really in terms of values or anything else. But it, there's something it, it discovered a particular hot spot for something, and I've forgotten what it is now. But some slightly random northern place is now is now somewhere because it has become a little centre for something, um, and it's been presumably like all of these places of low capital value things can happen more easily there. I suppose like East London, it's a bit like that, isn't yeah. it? You, stuff could happen because it's cheap to live there and suddenly, you know, it'll be gentrified. Um, I think it was Middlesbrough, but, you know, I suppose if we carry on with your disintegration argument, it would just, things just go round and round, presumably. And, and um, over time, stuff will just disperse and form a natural level, I suppose. What's well, the bit that Yolanda was mentioning there about um, Silicon Valley, that, was after all the MIT and the Cambridge outside um, Boston. And the reason why that took off is because the cross fertilization of ideas. People could meet up and socialize, and you know, mm. you'd have um, different people from different backgrounds working and mixing together to actually come up with new, fresh ideas instead of the silos that were very much prominent in, um, in Boston. Mm. So it's almost the case can you take that model for neighborhood housing and design it as well? Yeah. Yeah. And if neighbourhood housing actually becomes the place where we work, and uh, then, then I go back to my one of my first points was that actually, well, it's a thing I always end up saying at these things is people live in neighbourhoods, they don't live in housing units, you know, it's not a numerical thing mm. it's 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 about the place you live in, not, uh, you know, in the much broader sense. That's a great thing I always put in a lot of my, um, as a, um, little um, round plaque, I can't remember where I saw it, it says bricks build houses, people build communities. Mm. Yeah.
Um, to is, offer a contrary view, yeah. do people actually live in neighbourhoods? Um, walking around here, there have been a lot more people out on the footpaths than there are normally. So, and Tunbridge is a it's a town of about I don't know fifty thousand people. Um, I think you meet two different sorts of people. There are um, middle class people who are, um, they earn their living probably from London, basically, or, or some sort of middle class financial services um, occupation. Um, they are here in a bubble. Their, their, their life revolves around the commute and working in London and coming back and spending the money. Um, they're there's another group of people who actually live here and they're aware of the major landowners um, and they're in, in some ways dependent on the major landowners and it's a quasi feudal system for them I guess um, it, it's curious that um, well actually that um, there was the book published at the beginning of last year was it the people from somewhere and the people from anywhere do you recall that Oh, right. Um, the, the thesis there were, was that um, there's a sort of metropolitan community, um, pretty well educated, mostly universities. Um, they are attached, they, they get their life identity from their education and their career. There's another group of people, um, the people from somewhere. Um, I think the, the examples were given of um, uh, a farmer, a farmer's wife, um, <clears throat> And I use the term wife advisedly because um, in agriculture, that's very much the way it has been and probably still is. Um, their identity comes from the place where they live and they are they are rooted. And uh, Scott, what you were saying about the people in Buffalo, um, was it Buffalo? Yes, um, who uh, um, that they shared they identified with the place, they weren't focused on money. It's what you've described there seems to parallel what this author was describing about the um, people from somewhere, the people from anywhere. Mm. Very um, blue collar in Buffalo, so that would make sense as well. Uh, sorry? It's very blue collar in Buffalo as well. Yeah. So, it's, uh, you know, it's not about the educated class necessarily. And if you do go to university, you go somewhere else. And so people that were more blue collar would stay around and they were tied to more of the place then. Hmm. Just could, could we share, confess how many neighbors that we know? <laughs> um, how did you define no? Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I don't really. Sitting with your binoculars peering in the window. No, that's <laughs> not too far. Um. Not, <laughs> we see your binoculars in the back background. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, where I live, pretty much no contact with the neighbours. Um, so, I mean, my my community is probably the urban design, urban design public realm community, um, plus people who I've established friendships with over the past however many decades. And are, are people the same? Or are yeah. you, well, that's you, it. It's a fascinating question, doesn't it? It was it's kind of going through my mind. I mean, what is so what are cities and what is community? And I was, you know, your community is, in your case, your um, your work colleagues in mine. I do actually know a few of my neighbours, I suppose, been here that long. Um, but it, I, what was also going through my mind is this whole work and cities um, idiom. And I also had Norman Tebbit going through my mind because I've, I worked for a long time in social housing. This, these, these things crop up quite a lot. When people become workless, um, and their, their purpose in a place doesn't exist anymore because they're workless. Someone like Tebbit would have told them to get on their bike and go off somewhere else. Um, and you sort of think instinctively that's cruel and nasty and they shouldn't do that. But you kind of think, well, why are these places here in the first place? They're here, sort of going back to a sort of Marxist idea, they're here because some capitalist created a city because they needed something built or it was a, you know, a trading post, like, you know. And you sort of think, well, so what is community? I mean, what comes first? Does a community of people come first? Does the economy that creates these places come first? You know what I mean? So why why do why does anyone live every anywhere really? And there's in a sense the welfare state has just created instruments that have allowed people to stay put kind of well beyond the period where their factory has collapsed you know, years ago. You know, they have you know what I mean? They, why, 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 maybe people should go on their bikes and go somewhere that's appropriate for them to have a purpose. And if that happens to be work, 
great. I mean, if not, maybe it's something else. I don't know. But it's, it feels like some really big questions being thrown up out of this unwelcome change that's going on. The only reason I know my neighbor's here um, is because at nine, it started at 10 p.m. Someone started playing the Portuguese na national anthem. And you can see just like, it, it's just a street, it's a really short block, but everyone has balconies except for on the raised ground floor, which I live in. Um, and then it turned into um, playing because there's a, there's a couple that they knew um, they always walk the dog that's that's British. They started playing the British national anthem. <laughs> then um, my partner Marco, he's Italian, so they started playing the Italian one. And then they started playing Portuguese folk music. Then it turned out to be an hour long concert or party every night. And everyone just went on their balconies. And then at some point someone just started waving and everyone started waving. Then people started saying hi. Then they say, started saying good night. And I went to um, out today and talk to a neighbor, but I never did before. So it's it's interesting that it's prompted it. Um, the crisis didn't do it, but an outcome of it did. And it's the people I think almost want or sometimes need a reason to meet each other. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you facilitate that in everyday life. Yeah, you, we need more random discussions. I've got a friend who's in the Middle East and he said he normally hangs up in cold colors, but he spent 20 minutes talking to insurance salesman just because it was somebody different not to talk about work, COVID or anything else. Yeah. And I'm, I'm fortunate I chose where I live in York. I know quite a lot of my neighbors and it's kind of mixed from um, people working in shops to university professors to the shop owners across the road. And it's a very good, strong sense of community. We've had people popping notes through other people's doors saying, you know, if you're older and firm, I'll help you get you shopping and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. It's not quite like that early um, video shared, you know, was on TikTok back in the early stages of lockdown where somebody thought they'd help their neighbour and they put a little sign to say, "Can you, would you like any help? And she, the neighbour stuck their own sticker up saying, Do I do think in certain places, I mean, is it is London a less, as you said, a less kind of friendly place? Is it because of the, you know, some places in London are because people live there longer, are the people more interested because of their kind of their background and community? Thank you, Yolanda. It was really great to have you part of the session. I had to interrupt just because uh, Yolanda's got to leave. So. That's right. Re really great session. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank thanks to all of you as well. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Yolanda. Bye. Bye.